Acts chapter 20. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the privilege. Without you, we never would have met in this room. And Lord, this is just practice for heaven, where we get to be with you, to see you face to face. Lord, to understand then the things we can only pursue now by faith, that your ways are right and they're true, and that the things you've allowed in our lives, Lord, are for your purposes. And so, Lord, we pray as we continue through the word, may we be built up in our faith. May our hearts be encouraged and challenged. And Lord, thank you for the work you're doing in our midst for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 20, let's pick up verse 13. <clears throat> we went through some of this last week. By the way, how many enjoyed the, uh, the reggae band? Be honest. Okay. How many came out that night having heard them? You know what's shocking? Almost all of first service enjoyed them and came out. Now, if you're not sure, first service, they're the early crowd, if you know what I mean. And, and they, they, it was great. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> they're still talking about it. We went before to ship and we sailed to Assos, there intending to take in Paul, for so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And we talked about last week, he walked that distance. When he met with us at Assos, we took him in and we came to Mytilene. We sailed thence and we came the next day over against Chios. And the next day, verse 15, we arrived at Samos and then at Trogilium. And the next day we came to Miletus. So verse 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus. Again, three years of relationships, more dinner invitations than he could possibly touch. They'd never get out of there. So he sailed by there because he would not spend time in Asia or Turkey for you and I on the map. For he hastened, if it were possible, for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. The word in the Greek is presbyteros, in which we get presbyteria, the, the brothers or the elders of the church. And remember last week I told you there was a bit of a controversy around which word to use. Remember that? Well, we didn't get far enough along to solve it, but today we will, God willing. So he called for the presbyteros, the elders of the church. When they were come to him. He said unto them, you know, and it's emphatic in the Greek, you know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. Again, what he was in private, he was in public. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. He told them the good as well as the challenges, the bad and the judgment that God has for this world. I kept back nothing profitable to you. But number one, I have showed you, demonstrated it first. Number two, I have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. One, repentance toward God, turning from our sin and embracing him. Two, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound or driven, impelled in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Spirit witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Yet none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that you all, among whom I've gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. So that's where we pick up now, verse 25. As a group, they would not see him again. A few individuals would, but he let them know, this is it. So verse 26. Wherefore, I take you to record this day. Let the record show that I am pure from the blood of of all men. How many did the homework I gave the one week and read Ezekiel chapter three? Oh, wow, nice. First service were slacking on me. In chapter three, if you remember, <clears throat> there God said to him, son of man, prophesy what I have made you to the nation of Israel as a watchman upon the watchtower. And that is, you are to warn the nation. If a wicked man caught up in his wickedness, if I bring him before you and you warn him and he does not turn, he will die in his wickedness, but you, you're exonerated. However, if there's a wicked man and you fail to warn him, he will die in his wickedness, but I will require his blood of your hands. There's a righteous man who turns from his righteousness and you warn him and he persists in it. He'll die. 
but you're absolved. But if that righteous man turns from his righteousness and you fail to warn him, he'll die in that wickedness, but I will require his blood of your hands. And so basically, Ezekiel, you have a job. You are, you are bound. You are obligated to tell the nation of Israel what is coming, the judgment of God. And again, this is as the Babylonian captivity is happening. Jews have already been taken and deported to Babylon, and all these things are unfolding. Your job is to warn them of what I tell you, and that is it. He's not to worry about the results. His job is simply to declare God's truths. By the way, interesting thought. A sower went out sowing the seed. Some seed fell on the path, and the birds of the air plucked it away. Some seed fell on the shallow ground, and immediately it sprung up. But as the sun rose up, it withered and died. Some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked the seed. But some seed fell on the good soil, and it brought forth 30 60, hundredfold. Never in that parable did Jesus say the sower turned around and began to panic. It's on the path. He just sowed. We are not responsible for what people do with the gospel. But as believers, we are responsible to tell people the reason for the hope that lies within us. Our job is simply to sow. And there are times when hearts around us are hard like that path. And if we're honest, how many of you were there at one point in your unbelief? You were that hardened heart. You didn't want to hear it. You didn't want to hear it. But then time and conviction and God's spirit worked on you. And eventually someone came along and now the soil was good soil. And here came the seed again. And this time, yes, I need that. We're just responsible to sow. And Paul was saying much the same thing to the Ephesian elders. I've done my job, is what he's saying. You know how I behaved among you. You know how I lived when I came into this territory. You know the afflictions that have been done against me by my own fellow Jews and those who rejected the gospel. You've watched all these things. Wherefore, I take you to record this day. I'm pure. I'm innocent from the blood of all men. Why? Verse 27. For I have not shunned, shrunken, hid back, lower the sail, refuse to go forward. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Blessings? Absolutely. Judgment? You betcha. I give you the whole counsel of God. You know, there are churches today that only want to focus on one part of the counsel of God. That's their whole ministry. They focus on one aspect. I found it interesting that he's with the Ephesian elders. And then let's take a quick look at Ephesians. Turn a right turn to the book of Ephesians. Interesting to see all the things written in this short epistle by Paul. Starts chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Hey, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, chapter 1, verse 3, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's, for some people, that's their only ministry. That's all they preach on TV. How blessed you can be. Verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that should blow your mind, Wherefore, we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to the adoption of children. There are some churches, that's all they focus on. Predestination, election, salvation. Good things. Take a look at chapter 2, verse 1. You has he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, who in time past walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit now works in the children of disobedience. We all live like this among them, fulfilling the lusts of the flesh and the mind. And he goes through to verse 8 about the grace of God through faith. That's another part of God's truth. Interesting also, take a look at chapter 4. Look at verse 12. All in one epistle. God's given to the church prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. Look at chapter 4 around verse 20, 22. If you've been taught by him, you've heard of him. The truth in Jesus put off the old manner of living. The old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, be renewed in the spirit of your mind through reading the word. Put on the new man that we've received by faith, which is after God, created in righteousness and true holiness. So we've got our riches. We've got our predestination. We've got this idea we need to abide. We need to put off all these things in one epistle. He keeps going. Look at chapter 5. Be therefore followers of God as children. Walk in love, 
As Christ also loved us, gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. Chapter 5, verse 2, sweet-smelling savor, but fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as become saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain, worthless words. For because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not therefore partakers with them. Chapter 6, look at verse 6, look at verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God so you can stand against the wiles of the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Look at all the things he talked to him about in one epistle. Blessings, duty to abide, calling in ministry, equipping the saints, putting off the old man, walking in the new, remember where you came from, and by the way, we're in a spiritual battle. One epistle. They had three years with him in Ephesus. Back to our text. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Therefore, take heed. Why? What has he invested into them? God's word. What does that make them before God? Accountable. Oh, way to build us up, Pastor. Hey, listen, if you've sat in good Bible teaching churches and you've been taught the scriptures faithfully, simply, so you could understand what they mean, the whole counsel of God, you have truths and understanding of God that this world is woefully missing. You have a reason for the hope that's within you. You have the ability to tell sinners there's a Savior who loves to forgive them. You have the good news. And they don't. So Paul told these elders, hey, I'm blameless. I've given you the whole counsel of God. Take heed. First of all, you've been entrusted with the truth. But then he broke it down this way. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, number one, and unto the flock of God, number two. You see, if you don't take heed to yourselves, then you'll become eventually disqualified to be able to minister to the flock of God. Look what happened in the last few months in Fort Lauderdale within Calvary Chapel. A pastor who did not take heed to himself, got caught up in nonsense, destroyed his testimony, destroyed his family, destroyed his church. What happened? He failed to take heed to himself first. Well, we're not pastors. How many are married? Well, two, three of you, okay. We always want him to change or her to change. And yet the truth is, who's the only one God can change between us and him? Us. We can only be responsible for ourselves. Take heed to yourself and your walk with God and in your walk in your marriage and pray for them. Take heed to yourselves and to the flock over which the Holy Spirit, that's who put them in charge, the Holy Spirit has made you episcopus. I know you knew that. You have it written down next to the word too. Epi upon scopus. Hey, let's go scope out the picnic. What is scopus? To see, to look. What is epi? Upon. Upon or oversee. To oversee. Now, that's the other word used for elders. And there's been some big debates in the history of the church over should they be presbyteros or should they be episcopus? And they got so heated in this debate at one point at different times in the history that eventually one group formed and said we're the Presbyterians. The other group said we're the Episcopalians. You see, had they read Acts chapter 20, they would realize that the presbyteros and episcopus are used interchangeably for the same group of men. In other words, it means essentially the same thing. Well, that, you know, that's kind of loose and crazy. You've got to give me something else. Fine. Titus chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 7. Again, Titus, here are the requirements for a presbyteros, blameless, etc., etc. So should be the, and it's the same context, episcopus. They're used interchangeably. If they just read their Bibles, they could have saved all kinds of money on signage. <laughs> just a thought. Study for yourself. 
The Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now this gets interesting. To feed, not entertain. Not wow with fog machines. Feed. They're sitting there in the northern end of Sea of Galilee. Fish are on the coals. Bread's prepared. The disciples are there. Simon, son of Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I have affection for you. Well, then blow, my mind, blow the mind of my sheep with entertainment. Is that what he said? No, he said, feed them. Then he said, tend them. And then he said, feed them. Take heed to yourselves and to the flock of God over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God. Whose church is it? God's church. Look at this. Which he, he who? God, has purchased with his own blood. When was God's blood shed? On the cross. This verse is huge for several reasons. Number one, there were the Gnostics. The Gnostics claimed they believed in the deity of Christ, but they rejected the humanity of Christ. They could not see that God, deity, holy, pure, would somehow interact with physical, carnal, human, which they felt was just, there's no way, so they denied his humanity. That's 1 John 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits whether or not they be of God. Any spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, humanity, is of God. Any spirit that confesses not, this is the spirit of Antichrist. So first of all, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, the blood of God himself speaks of the humanity of Jesus Christ, that he is a man. Yet it also says the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So it also tells us of his deity. In one verse, you have both his deity, God purchased the church, and his humanity with his own blood. You have in one verse, for you theological people, the hypostatic union. What? The good hypo What's a hypostatic union? That God, that Jesus is fully God and yet fully man. He has to be able to shed literal blood or he cannot solve or pay for the law of God. The wages of sin is death and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. He has to be able to shed blood and he has to be sinless. That's why he's got to be God. So he can be our substitute. So in one verse, you have the deity of Christ and his humanity. In one verse, God has purchased with his own blood. This is a huge verse if you need that. And that's the area that you're debating or you're defending the deity and the humanity of Christ. Just an aside. I know you all knew that already, but we just had to point that out going by. So God has purchased with his own blood. Startling idea. Every one of you in this room who believe in Jesus, you have been blood bought. I don't know if God loves me today. I don't see God working in my life. I think he's forgotten about me. Really? You were blood bought. You really think he forgot about you? He knows what he's doing. So Paul went on, this I know, I know this, after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. People will come in and try to destroy this church in Ephesus. And also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse or twisted things to draw disciples away after them. So they're going to take scripture and twist it and get their own interpretation, rally a group around them and pull them away. Therefore, refrain from sleep, literally, watch. And remember, by the space of three years, one of the longest places he ministered, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, goodbye. That's basically what's happening. Guys, I'm innocent. I've declared you the whole counsel of God. I've kept back nothing profitable to you. You know how I lived among you. I set you an example. Therefore, I'm innocent. You've been bought by the blood of Christ. Once I leave, wolves are coming in. Other guys are going to rise up from among you and try to destroy the church. God bless you. Goodbye. See you later. <laughs> Seriously, that's what's happening. They're all like, wow. How could he just leave? Well, whose church is it? What does Paul know? 
God will take care of his church. By the way, your homework, your homework, Revelation chapter 2, church at Ephesus. Now that you know what they've been warned of, they were very diligent to watch some things. But in watching out for those things, they let the main things slip. So that's your homework. If you have the courage to read Revelation chapter 2, church at Ephesus. Starting in verse 1 there. It's worth reading. They got some things, they covered some bases, but they missed a few important things. Good study to have. Watch. Remember, by the space of three years, I warned you. And so verse 32, now, brethren, I commend you to God. After all, it's his church, and he purchased it with his own blood. To the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. Amen? Yeah. If you'll read it. And to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. We're going to be with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And by the way, it's not just the Ephesian elders he's hitting with this truth. It's Tychicus, and it's Trophimus, and it's Timothy, and it's Luke, and it's Gaius, and it's Aristarchus, and it's all the Secundus, whose brother is Primus. It's all these guys that have traveled with him. I'm giving you the warning. The baton is yours. Run with it. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, you yourselves know how these hands have ministered unto my necessities. He actually worked while preaching many times, not only covering himself, but to them that were with me. The city of Rome had a population of two million, one million of which were slaves at this time. Slaves were many of them, like Luke, the physicians, some the lawyers, some what we today would consider to be the professionals were slaves. Because in the Greco-Roman world, they viewed laboring and work as jobs for slaves, not for the wealthy. That's why we have slaves. And Paul here would work with his own hands as a Roman citizen, a free man, worked with his hands to set an example. He wasn't above it. He used it to support his ministry. I've showed you all things, verse 35, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. What gospel is that in? It isn't. Who said it isn't first? You got it right, gold star. It isn't. Well, then how did we get it? Well, there's a couple of thoughts. One is, it was shared with the apostles, who eventually shared it with Paul. Or two, Galatians there, chapter 2 going into 3, how he mentioned that he didn't receive his gospel message from anyone. He received it from the Lord. And he told us that he was in Arabia there with the Lord for a period, some say up to three years, where the Lord ministered to and invested in Paul. He came back to Damascus. They wanted to kill him. They let him out the window. We've been through all that. But somewhere along the line, this statement of the Lord got passed. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And I'll give you a particular when it really struck home for me. Hurricane Katrina 2005, we went down a month after the hurricane, literally a month. We ended up in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And we were doing work in this one neighborhood, and God just opened up. We, just, we kept coming back to help these people, strip the homes. Everything was destroyed. And you have to realize, you're talking hundreds of miles of coastline destroyed. So many, you know, up to miles of deep, depending on where it is. Everything just devastated. Boats on roofs when we drove into town. Stuff capsized all over the place. And we ended up in this neighborhood with, uh, with some folks. And there was this sweet guy, Kermit. His wife was Bonnie. And he came out one morning as we're all working away. And, and you know, the, you've lost everything, your wardrobe, everything. He's in sweats or whatever. And he comes out and he just starts bursting into tears. And, you know, and he's trying to talk. And I'm, I'm, you know, well, eventually what I figured out is he was just trying to say thank you. He said, you don't know how hard it is to receive this kind of help when we've been so devastated. To have people that would come, you know, whatever, how many hours from Pennsylvania to drive down here and come and clean out our houses and help us because we're all overwhelmed. None of us, none of us have a house to work from. That's when it came back to my heart. You know, it's really more blessed to give than receive. When Paul had thus spoken, he kneeled down and he prayed with them all. This is Paul the pastor. And they all wept sore. And they fell on Paul's neck. And that's not payback for sermons they didn't like. You dirty. That it means they hugged him. They embraced him. Okay, it's old King James. They fell on Paul's neck. They kissed him. 
sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, literally torn up here, just distressed in pain, for the words he spake that they should see his face no more. Now listen, some of you have probably come from a church where the pastor finally had to say, listen, God's moving me on and you will see my face no more. And the congregation began to weep. Oh, oh, thank God. Thank God he's finally leaving. We prayed him out. I'm serious. Some of you have probably been through something like that. That's not the case here. This is their sorrowed. And they truly appreciated his ministry. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, they'd see his face no more. And so they accompanied him to the ship. And so chapter 21, little, little uh, detail here to get through. Came to pass that after we, Luke is with them, that's why he's using we, we were gotten from them, literally tore ourselves away from them, and had launched. We came with a straight course to Coos. And the day following, we came unto Rhodes. What seven wonder of the ancient world was at Rhodes? The Colossus. How many knew that? That giant statue they put, some say the feet were over both sides of the harbor. Most say, no, it was only on one side. But there was this brass statue 105 feet high. It was erected in 290 B.C. It was toppled by an earthquake in 224 B.C., but the remains were still there. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. When you would come into the island of Rhodes, you would come into the harbor. There you would see this thing. Just a little travel note in case you see Paul. I don't know you knew that. So, Came into Rhodes. We passed through. From thence we came to Patera. Verse 2, finding a ship sailing over into Phoenicia, we went aboard and we set forth. When we had discovered Cyprus, that doesn't mean they put a flag on it and it's now found. It's they saw it sailing by, just so you know. When we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and we sailed into Syria and we landed at Tyre. Now their northern coast. For there the ship was to unlade her burden. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Wait a second. What was back in chapter verse 23? Chapter 20, 23, look at that. Paul said, Behold, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will befall me, save that the Holy Spirit witnesses in every city that bonds and afflictions abide me. Paul didn't say he was told not to go. He was just being warned what faces him when he does go. So why are these guys hearing, don't go? Am I the only one wondering that? All right, you're not, so we'll just keep going. Would you like an opinion? What is that worth? Zero. But I'll give you an opinion. Paul knows he's supposed to go. And the others are getting the same message that bonds and afflictions await him. But they've taken the answer of, therefore, you shouldn't go. And that can be a real struggle at times in your walk when you know what God's telling you and other people are telling you something that contradicts what God's telling you. Who should you go with? God's telling you. Because who will you be responsible for when you see him? What God told you. They said he shouldn't go. Verse 5, when we had accomplished those days, we departed, went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city. We kneeled down on the shore and we prayed. Here again, this fellowship. When we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship, and they returned home again. When we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Thomas and saluted the brethren, and we abode with them one day. The next day, we that were of Paul's company departed, and we came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven. Remember back early in the book of Acts, around chapter 4 or so, there is the gospel was increasing, and the widows are being neglected, and the different distributions. And so they said, you know, it's not good for us, the apostles, to leave the word of God in prayer and wait tables. Not that we're above this, or it's beneath us. But they had the three and a half years of ministry where Jesus invested in them. And so they needed to be teaching and discipling and seeking God. And others could help minister to the practical needs. So they picked out seven men full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. They set them over the task. One of which was Stephen, who died as a martyr. Another was here, Philip, who eventually would go down to Samaria. There in Samaria, the Lord would call him to Gaza. He goes to Gaza, here's the Ethiopian eunuch, he shares Christ with him, and he says, well, what keeps me from being baptized? He said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so Philip baptized him. 
And when they came out of the water together, the spirit caught Philip away to Azotus, and then he went up to Caesarea, and that's where we left him. And that was about 20 to 25 years before. And now, what do you want? We're looking for Philip the evangelist. Who's out there? Well, Trophimus, Tychicus, Gaius, Aristarchus, Secundus. See you have a brother, Primus? How'd you know? <laughs> Luke the physician and Saul of Tarsus. Who? Saul of Tarsus. You mean the cat that stirred up all the trouble in Jerusalem that killed Stephen and scattered all the rest of us? Yeah, he's out here with us. You want to meet him? Can you imagine that meeting? <laughs> Can you imagine that meeting? Uh, come on in. So they abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which interesting, according to church records or ancient records, the daughters, or at least some of them, lived to a great age, were highly esteemed as informants on the persons and events belonging to the early years of the Judean church. So apparently these four daughters, some of them were just a deep source of knowledge and resource for the early church to keep straight who did what, where, when, according to historians. Four daughters, which were virgins, which did prophesy. And we tarried there many days. Good sign, because just a few verses ago, they stayed in one town one day. Would have been a little suspicious if Philip had him in for one day. It's been nice to see you. Now go away. But they stayed many days. And there came down a certain prophet named Agabus. We saw him 10, 15 years before. He proclaimed a famine during the days of Claudius Caesar. He got it right. They decided to send relief to Jerusalem. But wait a second. Supply chain management question. If you already have four virgin daughters on site who prophesy, why send Agabus? Yeah, that's a good question. Because how God works is not always how we work. Once you learn to accept that, you stop arguing and just do what he says. Agabus showed up. He is credible. He had been right before. When he was come to us, verse 11, he took Paul's sash or girdle and he bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this girdle, this sash, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Don't do it. Even Philip, don't do it. Not, go ahead. Go ahead, your turn. No, they're all, don't do it. Paul answered, what mean ye to weep and to break my heart? What are you doing? For I'm ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Wow. When he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying the will of the Lord be done. Now here's an interesting question. And you really can't get hurt for voting. How many of you think Paul probably should not have gone? Be honest. I don't think he should have gone. How many of you think he should go? How many of you have chickened out and been no votes? <laughs> More than two. <laughs> when we look at something like this, we, we armchair quarterback or Sunday school quarterback, you know, what Paul did. We have to ask ourselves, what has Paul been characterized by since he met Jesus? Obedience. They stone him to death at Lystra. We think he died. We're not sure. 2 Corinthians 12, he pops back up, goes back in the city. Finish the job. Send me home. He didn't run. So I'll vote with those who say, I think he should go. Yeah, but wait a minute, it's going to become a disaster. He's going to get arrested. He's going to be in house arrest for two years in Caesarea. Yes, and he wrote to his Galatians or Ephesians and Philippians and some, you know, Philemon, some other things very important. Yes, he did. He was in prison, but we got prison epistles out of it. How many of you enjoyed the book of Ephesus? Me too. Book of Ephesians. We wouldn't perhaps have it if he was busy traveling all the time. When will we know for sure? We get to heaven. So let's leave it there. We're out of time. We'll pick it up here next week. Let's stand. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you have entrusted this treasure to us in our earthen vessels. God, give us open hearts that are willing to share the hope within us to those who ask. Lord, give us open hearts to step out of fear, step into faith, Lord, and share with those around us. We may be the only chance they have to hear that Christ came to save sinners. So God, we pray our hearts would just be open to you this morning. Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning that doesn't know you. Today would be the day right where they stand. They would realize they need to be forgiven. They would repent. They would come to you by faith. And they would receive you into their heart, Lord. As Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let that be for them today who don't know you, that they could leave here changed. And finally, a son or daughter by faith. Go with us, Lord, and thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen.